Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, so glad to be here with all of you. My name is Ben Allen, and I'm the state senator representing the West Side, so Coastal South Bay, Santa Monica Mountains, Hollywood communities of Los Angeles County. I also happen to chair the Senate's Committee on Environmental Quality, which among many things oversees waste management, recycling, all those kinds of issues. And I've had the opportunity to work a lot in this space, most recently with the passage of SB 54, which is an important, kind of globally important bill on the circular economy, waste management, recycling, et cetera. Uh, so, so this is all about trying to you know, figure out ways that we can all contribute to a more sustainable future uh, as individuals. Uh, but of course, we know that composting and recycling can also be incredibly confusing for everyday consumers. And so we've been working really hard at the state uh, to implement a number of new groundbreaking laws that are aimed at making, uh, basically reducing the amount of waste that ends up in our, our landfills or worse in our oceans, our waterways and open spaces. And we're, we're, we're looking to do it in a way that in, in many respects puts more responsibility in the hands of the producers and those who actually have more tools at their disposal to help solve the problem. Now, all that being said, everyday folks have a role to play as well. And um, you know, we know that sometimes you know, figuring out which goes into which bin or sometimes you know, how to make sure that uh, if, if something goes into a bin at all uh, can be a real challenge. And so it's my hope that at the end of this program, you'll have at least some more information uh, to make sure that you can ensure that your waste is being disposed of as sustainably and as responsibly as possible. Because uh, I know nearly everybody wants to do the right thing, and sometimes they don't know exactly uh, what to do and what goes where. In fact, part of what got me into this in the first place was I realized that I was dutifully putting my little newspaper bags you know, that had a recycling symbol into the recycling bin, thinking that it would be recycled. And then I come to find out that it was actually making the system worse by gumming up machines and all the rest. And that sent me down a massive rabbit hole that uh, led to passage of several bills, and some of them of real of, of, of major impact. Uh, and now you know, here we are talking about this topic today to make sure that, that you have the tools you need to, to, do, to do right. So we're going to look at some of the, the new California laws on this topic, uh, and then we'll turn it over to some of our friends from Athens Services who actually work directly in this space to teach us the basic do's and don'ts of composting and recycling. But, but first of all, I do want to touch uh, briefly on why composting is such a critical component of our uh, of reaching our state's sustainability goals. Organic waste is, in fact, California's largest waste stream, accounting for something like over half, 52 percent of the trash that we produce each year. And that includes a whopping six million tons of food waste annually, which, of course, is really notable given the context of food insecurity being such a prevalent problem across our state. We've got you know folks who are, who are going hungry and yet we're throwing out you know, six million tons of food waste every year. We also know that organic waste is exacerbating our climate crisis, something that folks don't always realize, but, but compostable waste that ends up in our landfills instead of in the composting stream currently accounts for 20%, nearly a quarter of our uh, state's annual methane emissions. And we know that methane is a super pollutant. It's got a greenhouse effect that's actually 84 times more potent than that of carbon dioxide. Uh, so, you know, after the past several years of extreme weather events, I don't think I need to remind anyone that California is already feeling the impacts of climate change. And we know that curtailing methane emissions by reducing the amount of organic waste that we're producing uh, and, and you know, ending up in the landfills, that, that really does have to be a major component of our efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and prevent these impacts from becoming more problematic than they already are. So given these enormous challenges, the legislature has passed and the governor has signed into law uh, a truly unprecedented policy back in 2016 that my colleague, uh, then Senator Lara, uh, uh, passed, you know, wrote, uh, which aims to significantly reduce California's organic waste footprint. So this was SB Senate Bill 1383. It was authored by, as I say, my, my former colleague and now actually the current insurance commissioner, Ricardo Lara. And it sets a statewide goal of reducing the amount of organic waste that we send to landfills by 75% of 2014 levels by 2025. Now, the law also requires that residences and businesses, if they were not already doing so, have to begin sorting and separately collecting organic waste, uh, which is a provision that went into effect at the beginning of last year. So this means that your local waste hauling provider has to provide you with a mechanism to compost your food scraps, your green waste, your soiled paper, 
et cetera. So we'll we'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like in just a few few minutes. Uh, of course, you know we also know that organics are not the only problematic type of waste that's polluting our environment. Uh, despite longstanding efforts to strengthen California's recycling infrastructure, single-use plastic pollution continues to have detrimental impacts on public health, on government budgets, and on uh, our natural environment. So, uh, you know, how, I, I got involved with this when when China implemented its national sword policy in 2017. It used to be that we would just ship all of our plastic recycling waste, or at least the majority of it, off to China. And the Chinese realized that it, it actually were losing money off of it. It was polluting their environment. So much of it was ending up in their own water streams and incinerated. They say, we're bringing down the national sword. We're no longer going to keep taking your waste. And so now what, what used to be a revenue source for local governments has now actually become a drain uh, on, on local governments. Uh, not only in terms of litter cleanup, and we're spending almost half a billion dollars a year, to our, just our taxpayers alone are spending about half a billion dollars a year just on, on plastic waste cleanup, but it's also become... Uh, a major new cost burden on our local governments and thus on our ratepayers and taxpayers as they try to find a way to, uh, to, to to find new places for all this extra plastic trash that's ended up in our system. And of course, that's once we have this stuff, as it's being produced, plastic production, uh, you know, plastic um, uh, you know, production uh, requires the burning of fossil fuels. It's a major source of greenhouse gas emissions. And it, and it further fuels our climate crisis. In fact, it's an important petroleum product uh, and one that the, the oil industry is really trying to put a lot of emphasis into as a, as a next step industry. So we've been trying to address this issue in California. And I'm, I'm really proud that, that you know, my office is, was able to uh, take on a leadership role in this area. One simple reform that I authored and we passed back in 2021 aims to make the process of identifying what actually goes into the blue bin much simpler uh, for those of you at home. And this gets back to my own realization that in, in trying to do the right thing, I was actually making things worse by putting my my newspaper bag into the recycling bin. You know, and I did so because I saw the recycling symbol on the bag. Well, turns out it wasn't actually getting recycled. It was gumming up the machines, making the system work less efficiently. So our bill, SB 343, Senate Bill 343, expanded California's existing truth in environmental advertising law which banned the use of words like recyclable and non-recyclable products. And it basically extended that prohibition to include the chasing arrow symbol. So you know, this is basically said, look, if you're not, if this product is not actually recyclable under real world conditions on the ground right now, if it's not getting recycled, then it shouldn't put the recycling symbol on the product. Uh, it shouldn't be making the already complicated process of sorting through trash to, to, to divvy out the the, the, the truly recyclable items, uh, it, it shouldn't be gumming up that process any more than it already is. So first and foremost, the bill is going to help to ensure that non-recyclable materials don't continue to end up in our streams of recyclable waste, as you know people are dutifully doing, but doing so in a way that actually isn't helpful. Uh, so that'll that'll you know reduce the overall amount of waste that is um, successfully reused. Um, you know. Um, you, we, 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 so, so that, that that's what's been going on right now, right? I mean, right now, uh, because of the, the the use of the chasing arrow symbol, that's confusing people. The overall amount of waste that's out there is 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 um, you know we're, we're reducing the amount that's actually successfully reused. We're impeding the sorting process, and we're ultimately driving up costs for ratepayers. Moreover, we hope that this change is also going to help to incentivize producers to put products on the market that are truly recyclable. And speaking of which. One year later, after the passage of 343, and after four years of deliberations and negotiations with environmentalists and industry stakeholders, um, you know, we were able to, to finally pass this very significant bill, uh, SB 54. Um, it's the strongest anti-plastic pollution policy you perhaps ever implemented in, in the world. I know it's a, a bold claim, but it's been, been stated by several newspapers. So SB 54 has three main components to tackle the plastic pollution crisis head on. Uh, first, it requires that producers reduce the overall amount of single use packaging that they're putting on the market by 25% over the next 10 years. Then it requires that all uh, remaining material must be truly recyclable or truly compostable by the end of that same time frame. And then lastly, the bill transfers the financial responsibility for the end life of, their, of the products from the ratepayers and local governments where it currently uh, sits 
we're, you know, it's basically all of us that are paying to bandage over the, the, the deficiency of the system. It's going to transfer the fiscal, financial responsibility from us, ratepayers, local governments, over to producers, uh, including, a, a, by the way, a, a half a billion annual uh, fund that producers are going to have to pay into to mitigate the environmental impacts of plastic pollution. You know, the idea behind both of these bills is that producers, not everyday consumers, ultimately, they're the ones who have the most tools at their disposal to address these issues of recyclability, compostability, reuse, et cetera. They know their products best. They know their markets best. They know their design and their uh, supply chains best. And ultimately, they've got the most tools to actually address these issues of true circularity with regards to their own products. They're the ones who ought to be most res responsible for the life cycle and environmental impacts of the products that they keep putting out onto the market. So we're continuing to prioritize waste management solutions that implement this idea of what's called extended producer responsibility. Now, that being said, of course, for any of these policies to succeed, we're always going to need the participation of those of you at home. And I will say, it, it, you know, these each of these bills are going to take some time to be implemented. So both in the build up to their implementation and in the meantime, we need to know the reality and the facts on the ground now as we transition toward an SB 343, SB 54 future for our state. So now that you've learned a little bit about the policy backdrop uh, at our state level, I want to turn it over uh, uh, to this evening's expert panelist who's going to walk you through the basics of composting and recycling for residents and small businesses. And I just want to you know, and ask you to join me in welcoming the Director of Sustainability and Zero Waste Programs for Athens Services, which is the largest waste hauler in LA County, my friend, Jessica Aldrich. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, great uh, coverage of those bills. Um, I'm very excited for the work that you've been doing and us in the environmental world and the waste world are very appreciative of all of your of all of your work. Um, I mentioned some of it in the PowerPoint that we're going to go through, and I'm so happy we don't have to spend the time on that stuff because you've already done it. And I absolutely love your PowerPoint, too. I was like, wow, I need mine to be up to par with yours. That was great. <laughs> I am going to share mine. Let me know. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Give me a second here. And by the way, if folks want, I, I've been, you know, first of all, this webinar will be uh, available to view afterwards. We're going to post it on our on our uh, website. Um, and then also, if you want to drop questions in the chat, you're welcome to. We'll be starting to go through them. And I'm going to try my best to get to all of them as we discuss uh, together. Well, we yes. Just yes. I'm going to time myself so I don't go over here. And can everyone see my screen? Yeah, looks great. Perfect. Okay, let's get started. So we're talking trash today, the, the topic of my choice always. And as Senator Ben Allen uh, mentioned, we are with Athens Services, and I am the Director of Sustainability. Athens, just a little bit, we may be your waste hauler. Um, when I mean waste, I'm talking about those big trucks that come around and they collect the trash and the recycling and the organics, and they separate it out the way it needs to be. They make sure they're either processing it, like we would be processing the organics, or we're separating the recycling out to be able to be processed by an actual recycling uh, plant. We are family owned and operated. We've been in operation since 1957. Uh, we service over 40 municipalities in Southern California, including Orange County, LA County, obviously, San Bernardino, Riverside, Ventura. We have um, seven operating facilities. Four are material recovery facilities. Those are the things that people would call a recycling facility, even though things are not being particularly recycled. They're being separated out into their respective piles so that they can eventually be recycled by an actual recycling facility. We have four of those, MRFs. Uh, we have a compost facility. We also participate in anaerobic digestion with some of our organics processing. And we're going to get in a little bit of the detail of what the organic, well, we're going to get a lot of detail of what the organics are. And definitely with the questions, put them in the chat and we will get to them at the end of the conversation because I might answer your question along the way. We do not own any landfills. We are a landfill avoidance company. We do operate the San Bernardino landfills, but we don't own them. We still have to pay to what it's called tip our loads at the landfill uh, so that it can be landfilled if it's not able to be recycled or composted, right? And so, yeah, that, that's us, that's Athens. And before we get into 
the nitty gritty of everything. There is this word out there called zero waste. And I like to be able to take the moment to really define what that means, uh, because there's a lot of confusion around this. It seems unobtainable. It seems sort of new. It seems like, oh my gosh, how do we get to zero? It seems as if it only deals with the stuff that we have downstream. Well, I didn't throw anything away, so I must be zero waste, or I'm able to fit every same thing inside this little tiny jar. So I'm zero waste. Well, zero waste is not that. Zero waste is holistic in nature. It is indigenous by nature. And there is only one, there's a the, the first peer-reviewed, internationally accepted definition of zero waste in the more professional business aspect of it all. And that is this version. It is the conservation of all resources. It's not everything that's like just downstream, what you're throwing in the trash can. And that is by the means of responsible production, consumption, reuse, recovery, recovery meaning recycling at all, of everything, of the products, the packaging, and the materials without burning them. So in Sweden's like, we burn everything and we, we're we zero waste. That's not the case by this definition. With no discharges, this is important, to land, water, or air that threaten the environment or human health. If within this process, it is threatening the environment or human health, then by this definition, it is not zero waste. And so when we're looking at a product, just because it can be recycled does not mean that it's good for the environment. So just want to put that out there. So what is our issue here? And, and the Senator touched upon this, and I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty here, but just to throw the fact out there, we create in the United States three pounds per, of waste per person per day when you take away the recycling, the compost, the food recovery, meaning the food that's donated. But in California, we create almost seven pounds of waste per person per day. And you may say to yourself, Jessica, I don't create that much. I got like the coffee cup from the, the store down the street or my packaging came like this, such and such, but I don't feel like I'm creating that much. But what we don't know, what we what's not taught to us is that there, for every ton of waste, for everything downstream, right? There's 70 tons upstream of waste that went into creating that product. So the chain of waste for one particular product, for, for tons of product is so much greater when you look at the upstream chain to get that product to us in the first place before we ever even place it into, into the container to hopefully be recycled or composted or, you know, unfortunately, landfill, right? So what does that look like when it comes to plastic? And uh, the senator and I have very uh, similar views on our, you know, the inability to be able to recycle a lot of plastic and our consumption, mass consumption of plastic. But let's get this straight, too. We are, we're inherently part of the whole solution, the whole problem. But with these pieces of legislation that the senator is talking about, the responsibility is not always and should not always be on the consumer, right? That responsibility is pushed upstream to the manufacturer as well, because if we're getting materials that we can't recycle, if we're getting materials that the waste hauler can't do anything with, because the the there's no economy for it, there's no like real world solutions in all actuality that are scalable for certain materials, then what are we gonna do with this material and why are we getting it in the first place? So when you look at the amount of plastic waste that is in the in our environment, you can line every foot of coastline around the world with equivalent of five grocery bags stuffed with plastic trash on every foot of coastline. The Ellen MacArthur Foundation through their new plastics economy at this point, it's a little bit older, uh, uh, did this research, they said by 2050, if we keep going at the rate that we're going with the manufacturing of plastic, we will have more plastic in the ocean by weight than we will fish. There's another stat here on the oil consumption. Right now, at 2014, 6% of the oil that was manufactured went into the uh, production of plastic. Now, it says um, that, the, that, that by 2050, it'll be 20%. It's much more than that now. It's a lot more than that now, especially since we have many opportunities for uh, oil extraction within this country that we didn't have uh, back in 2014. And just to reiterate what the Senator said, organics is so important. When people say, you know, we were taught, right, since, since the really since the 50s with the Keep America Beautiful, but through the 80s and the 90s and everything, right, we're taught that 
if we recycle, we're environmentalists. That's the thing that we can do. Really, the thing that we can really do that we have control over as environmentalists is the organics, is the food that you have that gets wasted. If you can compost that, if you can put it in your green container on the curbside, or you can, you have a backyard compost, or you're taking it to LA compost and you're dropping it off, or you're dropping it off your community garden, fantastic, whatever it is that you're doing, that is one of the biggest impacts that you can have for the environment when it comes to what you solely are doing as an individual, because that is the third largest source of human related methane emissions in this country, as well as California. And um, the amount of food, they actually upped it from 14 to 18%. Now, the amount of wasted food going into the landfill is upwards of 14%. The amount of all the organics together is 40%. And then we have people who are struggling to find a healthy and nutritious meal but we are throwing all this food away, right? So we're not going to get too much into this. We talked about SB 1383. We talked about why it was so important. We talked about, our the senator talked about how everyone has to participate in organics uh, recycling now from single family homes to apartment complexes to businesses. And I know not all apartment complexes have it yet. Maybe not all businesses, uh, but it's happening. Uh, I can't speak to other waste haulers, but I can say that we're here to help onboard that. We created a manual for multifamily residential complexes. We're here to help those MFDs, we call them MFDs, those apartment complexes, on board for this. Uh, what do they have to do? So a business and a multifamily complex has to have an adequate size container for all of the organics that they create. If they just get this tiny little container, but they're creating a dumpster's worth of organics every single week, then they're not in compliance. Uh, the containers that the that people utilize, whether it's the dumpsters or the carts, the carts meaning the little plastic things with the wheels that you roll out to the curb, we have all this like crazy nomenclature for for the waste industry so if i say anything that is you know like what was that waste nerd word just let me know <laughs> but uh those containers wherever the organics or the recycling are going in if it's just like some normal front of house container that the businesses utilize for their customers or their tenants or whatever it is uh those have to be easily accessible they have to have signage they have to be they have to have the correct labels and those businesses and those multifamily complexes have to annually educate everyone that utilizes that facility and then they also for any tenant meaning it could be a business tenant or a residential tenant they have to provide them with information and education within 14 days of move-in. And if you're a business and you're watching or a multifamily and you have admins, we can help you with that information. We got you. Uh, we can even come out and educate annually. We can give you some cheat sheets. We got email templates for you that can send out. We, we make it so easy for you. And then um, just container sign up again. The stuff is supposed to be grouped together, <laughs> front of house, supposed to have that signage easily accessible. And then they get some like, yeah, you might want to consider color coding. It makes it easier for people, right? When they know it's blue, green, black. Uh, if, if you have the three streams, sometimes Athens, we have cities with two stream, meaning that the recycling and the trash go together. And we have our materials recovery facilities that are top notch that are able to go through those materials. And so we have some, some cities with all three separate containers for organics, recycling and trash. And then we have some cities with recycling and trash together and organic separate. Also, if you're going to hang signage, I'm going to tell you Velcro dots are your best friend because you can remove that stuff from the wall, clean the wall, stick it back up. You can put the Velcro dots on the container and you're not like going, oh my gosh, the, the, the signage fell off. Where's the tape? No one has tape. Let's just prop it up against the container. And then miraculously the signage disappears and you're like, I don't have any more signage. Velcro dots, your best friend. So when it comes to edible food, now rest Edible food generators that are considered uh, tier one or tier two, and I'm going to say all edible food generators should donate their food, uh, but they have to donate 100% of the material that would have otherwise gone to the landfill or gone to compost if it's still edible. And they have to have contracts and agreements with food recovery partners, and they have to uh, keep their records. And a lot of organizations are partnering with like food recovery apps and uh, to be able to track that, like Carrot, C-A-R-E-I-T. Uh, so there's a lot of information and we're not going to get into the details of that, but if you have some questions, let me know. So I'm going to talk about outreach 
right now, we have a lot of online resources and I'm sure they'll send this out to you. So you don't have to like frantically like take the screenshot or whatnot, but we have a lot of information for you. We even have our canirecyclemy.com page, which is an online guide of 400 guide items. And if you're an Athens services, uh, if you're serviced by Athens, you can go on there and search for your city uh, and then search the, the guide item. It probably 90% of the time also would apply to your other waste haulers as well if you're not with Athens because um, it's really in compliance with state legislation and SB 1383 and all that. But 90% of the time, but I would also say, please check in with your waste hauler to make sure what they can and cannot take. We even have a restaurant training video. That's that bit.ly down there. Uh, we have cheat sheets and signage and just lots of awesome information for you. We even have additional tenant signage that we made for multifamily because we'd go in there and they're like, well, we need something for cardboard and we need something to remind people to shut their lid on their container. And we've created it all. It's on our website. Go take a look, print what you need. If you're an Athens customer and you're multifamily and you want some of this, we might have it printed. Let us know. When you're an Athens, when you're serviced by Athens in your business, and really this, this is really good for, I think everyone across the board. Uh, Liners are very important. When you're living in a single family home, uh, it, don't don't use liners unless you need to. That's just a waste. If you are, and, and a lot of the times um, with Athens and other waste haulers, recyclables need to be loose. Um, the organics can, with us and others, be in clear, translucent bags, liners. Um, this doesn't apply to all cities. Sometimes it needs to be loose. So please, please, please check with your waste hauler. Uh, but for businesses, we tell them to bag because we know they're not going to be going and dumping these big containers. And But we need to be able to see into the bag. We need to be able to see what's in there. So translucent is always great. Even with the landfill, because your maintenance are picking it up, they're going to go, oh my gosh, this looks like a ton of recyclables. Or, oh my gosh, this is not recyclables. This is trash. They're going to know to put it in the trash container so it's not contaminating, right? And then just some things to take into consideration. Always group things. If you're in a prep area, make sure you got the prep area going. And if you have like an office, got to be doing organics, right? So get that little kitchen caddy. And let's talk about kitchen caddies. So this is something that you should be doing at home and you're in your single family and you're, because all of us are, um, you know, I, I would assume that all of us are, you know, have a place that we reside um, with a kitchen. And that is where you can set up a portable, reusable pill-like container with a tight fitting lid. Maybe your city, maybe your waste haulers providing you for that area, one of these little kitchen caddies, or maybe you want to make your own, or maybe you want like one of those fancy ones, you know, and that are, that are stainless steel. Who knows? Whatever. If it's collecting your organics, fantastic. So what are you going to do with that? You're going to fill that pill. And uh, again, check with your waste hauler. Liners may be accepted, may not be accepted. I know in the city of Glendale, yeah have to have liners no matter what for your organics. But then there are other cities that say they don't want the liners. So uh, just make sure. But uh, so you're going to fill it. You're going to empty that into the container where it needs to go. I, it might be a cart. It might be a dumpster. And then you're just going to rinse and repeat. And you're going to clean that container to make sure that you keep the odors down. And again, our bags accepted in the green container for most cities and for all of Athens, yes, they are. But again, they have to be clear. And it doesn't matter if they're petroleum-based plastic or bioplastic. And we're going to talk about bioplastic in a second because, no, bioplastics looks like plastic made out of plants, says it's certified compostable, still not going to be accepted for composting by no one, not just by Athens, by no one in Southern California all the way up the state. There's a couple cities that are still accepting, but I'll tell you, most of them are not processing it. And that is actually in violation of SB 1383. So we'll get into that because I know that's a question that everyone has. But yeah, so the bags, when they go to our compost facility or our anaerobic digestion will be ripped open, the contents will be liberated and the bags will go to trash. So what are some ways, and someone says, it smells, I don't want to do it, it's going to attract rodents, it's going to attract animals, it's going to smell, it's going to have gnats, it's going to have ants, it's going to have all of this. I have been composting 
with a little container uh, or collecting my organics for over 10 years. And so I've gone through the like, oh my gosh, why do we have an ant problem in California? Uh, so <laughs> I'll tell you, which is not on this one, uh, Castile soap, Dr. Bronner's, if you mix it with water and Dr. Bronner's and you can spray a little bit, it's great. Uh, uh, keeps the flies and the ants down. Don't overstuff, close your lid. Uh, rinse the pell when it's empty, clean it out. If you can um, have the ability to freeze the things that might smell more, like your meats and your bones and your dairy stuff, get like a little uh, yogurt Tupperware container and put that type of stuff in there, put that in your freezer. And when it becomes trash day, go and empty that container, not the container itself, but empty the container into your organics and then start over, right? Sprinkling um, baking soda in the bottom of your container before you start filling it up, the, the kitchen pail, or even in, if you have a cart outside doing that, putting newspaper, lining newspaper at the bottom of your, your organics cart, the wheel cart that goes out to the curb. Uh, that is also super helpful. It helps clean, keep the container clean so you're not having to rinse the actual cart out as much. So where's our waste going? This is just real quick. Athens has four, the fourth one's not on here, but we have four materials recovery facilities. We have organics facility, a compost facility. We do anaerobic digestion. So what is recyclable? I know this is the thing that everyone's like, okay, let's get to the nitty gritty, right? Let's get to the things like, what can I actually put in my recycling container? When it comes to plastic, we're looking at containers, the food containers, beverage containers, um, sometimes it's the packaging containers. It doesn't always have to be for food. Uh, so this type of stuff here, and I'm gonna and and it's the one the 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 highly recyclable material is gonna be your number ones containers, your number twos, and your number fives. The rest of it doesn't really have that big of a market. They may say in certain cities we'll accept it, but they're probably gonna source it out. But at the same time, they're still trying to find potential markets for this material. It just doesn't mean that there's a market for it at this moment. When it comes to glass, all glass has a different melting point. So the glass that goes into your recycling container is your beverage and food glass, the stuff that beverage and food came in, not your porcelain that you would drink, not this, not your porcelain, not your ceramic. Those are all different types of glass uh, that their heating point is different so that when it becomes colored and they're mixed together, it actually damages the glass, the recycled glass. And that's why it's not able to be mixed together. Uh, cartons, not all waste haulers take cartons. That's the little milk carton and the almond milk down there. Paper across the board, but the more laminated it is, the more stuff is on it, the more plastic is on it. Yeah, it's going to not be as recyclable. It might be accepted by the recycling plant that's accepting the mixed paper, but they're going to have a threshold. You know, the more that there is mixed material on stuff, the harder it is to recycle. Although those carton things, they have lots of mixed material, but it takes a lot of energy to actually recycle them. And there's not that many plants that are actually recycling them. Uh, and then metals, metals are great. Metals are great. Don't uh, I'll say this in a second on the next slide, but uh, they're, they're fantastic. The more metal it is, fantastic. It's got like a plastic handle here. That's all right. We'll take it. Definitely empty it of food and liquid, but it doesn't have to be spotless. Does not have to be spotless. If it's paper with food and liquid on it, that is trash. Unless it's food soil paper. And we'll talk about that in a second, like good food soil paper. So the... Oh, we talked about this, right? The um, SB 343, the um, truth in advertising. Just because it has that thing on it, <laughs> it doesn't mean that it's actually recyclable. Go figure, right? That is a resin identification code. That was when the plastics, manu any manufacturer use utilizing plastic was told by the US government that they had to make recycling easier. And this is what they came up with, was to say, well, we'll identify the resin. And then they had a contest and someone from USC designed this thing and, that's where it came about. Doesn't mean it's actually recyclable. And so the, so don't be fooled by that. But thankfully we have something like SB uh, 343 that's going to hopefully fix this issue. Uh, just because something is recyclable doesn't mean that's going to get recycled. Like with plastics, again, like I said, the white, the, the white, the one, the twos and the fives, but also fives, there's black plastic number five. I'm wondering if I have it around me. No, number five. A lot of the times it's black plastic. Well, black 
dark colored plastic is not identifiable by these optical sorters that use light to identify it. And then also the economics out there don't really want the black plastic. So even though it's a number five, it has a low recyclable rate, but that's not something y'all would know, right? That's something that the manufacturers need to be working with us, the recyclers, to be able to know that they're giving you the, the proper material. Um, but now you know. Uh, also the four inch minus rule. If it's too small, even if it's made out of number five, two, or one, they, they might not get recycled. If it's tinier than your hand, palm of your hand, it might not, it might not get recycled. They're too skinny, right? It's just going to fall through the system. So in things like this, if you are able to, if you have the privilege of being able to not use, if to be able to bring your own utensils, to be able to not use a straw, to not, to, to have your own reusable hot mug so you don't have to drink out of this, that's fantastic. Also, just keep in mind that plastic, when it gets hot, sheds. It sheds so much microplastics. And those microplastics are going into the liquid and you are then ingesting that liquid. So it's also very important for just health purposes, maybe to consider um, what hot liquid touches the plastic that you utilize. Uh, contamination could be mixed packaging types. You know, it's not this Kite Hill one, love Kite Hill, but they have a paper around their plastic and it says remove the paper before recycling. Well, they know that because they know that the optical sorters can't read the plastic because it's got this paper film on it or this, yeah, this paper. And so it makes it really hard to recycle that because we have to be able to read it to be able to pull it off the line. Same thing with these like almond milk containers or that have the sleeve that goes up the whole entire almond milk, but the sleeve is a number four plastic and the almond milk is a number two. And we're not going to have you remove that sleeve. There's, there's cash redemption value that's attached to it. There's, it's impossible to remove anyways. And so it's like, oh, I wish the manufacturers were working with us so that they would understand what we're able to capture and what the best design would be for that product for optimal recycling. Also, don't crimp your metals together. I've seen zero waste influencers tell you to do that. Don't do that. Don't throw a bunch of stuff in together in one container and close it off like everything's got different value. Crush your cardboard. <laughs> so what is organics? Organics is plant matter and food scraps. It is a hundred percent fiber-based food, soil, paper. No bioplastics, no wax, no petroplastic. A hundred percent fiber-based. And then if you look over here, some other stuff that doesn't go in the organics, fats, grease, and oil, um, diapers, tea bags, gum, it's got plastic. Most of it's got plastic and there's no way for us to tell that it doesn't. And then you've got microplastics in the compost and we don't want that, right? We don't want microplastics in our soil. Textiles, hard shells, because that's not going to break down. Uh, those little stickers, they're not made out of biodegradable material. They're plastic, but a lot of people don't know that. Uh, so just to talk about these um, fiber-based material, uh, that just means that it's, you know, the bioplastics look like they're made out of plants, but they're actually, they're made out of plants, but they, they look like they're made out of plastic. And it could be a coating. It could be a filler. It could be a liner. If you look at the package and it looks kind of shiny, that's probably a bioplastic. So it can't be a coating, a limer, liner, a laminate, any of that. And the paper has to be food soiled. Plus it's got to be a food product. So anything that tells you like, oh, my... My phone case is compostable plastic. No, uh, actually they don't certify this is compostable. The only thing that certify as compostable is foodware. So when someone says my phone, my phone's compostable, it's greenwashing. Uh, greenwashing meaning they're telling you something to be environmentally based, but there's no backup to that. Uh, that is viable uh, within the, the nature of the system, right? There's also edible foodware, but way too expensive to be um, plausible. So other things that shouldn't go in there, tissue paper, uh, any anything that is not for food, right? Uh, is not allowed in a compost facility. What about napkins, by the way? So the napkins, yes, if they're only soiled with food, not fats, grease, and oil, 
right? And they are, they don't have a bunch of dyes. They're not like, they're not like heavily dyed, like a, like a red napkin for Christmas or something like that, uh, because all those dyes are bad. So it needs to be just like a normal white paper towel. And in all actuality to, if you want to do right by the, the soil, it should be something that's not bleached. So now you're going to the brown ones, right? The brown paper towels and stuff like you would get from like Starbucks or something. And, 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 and clean napkins, they don't, they're not, are they paper recyclable? No, no. no. The fibers are too short. And I'm amazed. They're so no tea bags, no receipts. Yeah, let me get there. So like the receipts got uh, BPA, um, which is an endocrine disruptor, and it's uh, just a bunch of toxic material. And again, the only thing that can go into compost, because compost is certified specifically for uh, under OMRI and CDFA, California Department of Food and Agriculture, and they only allow specific materials. So it has to be food based. Uh oh, did I freeze? You can still hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, and then the tea bags got plastic in them. I'm going to show you that in a second. Most gum has plastic in it. So y'all do not swallow your gum and do not spit it out into the environment. Um, so let me go to that next one. Here we go. So the tea bags, uh, most tea bags have some sort of plastic in them. It's either going to be in the glue, in the stitching or in the bag itself, especially if it's one of those silk ones. <laughs> No one's going to let you buy silk for a buck, you know, um, some of them don't, but because it's so few and far between and it's such, it, it, it's such a grab. You don't know what is good and what's not good. We just tell people across the board, we don't want to take the risk because we cannot legally say that we will take contaminants into our compost, um, or we're not going to be able to sell our compost to organic farms. Uh, that it's a straight no. It's got a, most of them. And the thing is, I think a lot of waste haulers I've seen, they start out by putting tea bags on their signage. And then years later, they take the tea bag off their signage because they start to realize they either see a presentation like this or they start to realize this, this stuff is not breaking down. Even the paper straws. So a lot of people complain about the paper straws. So a lot of times it'll be like paper straw, but then people don't know that where they're buying it from is lining it with wax, plastic, or bioplastic, and the paper straws are not even breaking down in the compost facilities. And so, and also with the fiber, the reason why we can't like compost textiles is because 60% or more of our clothing is made up of plastic. Like there's one stat uh, that like when you, un it's just all these nanoparticles of plastic, right? And when you unscrew the cap of a water bottle, every single time you're unscrewing the cap of a water bottle, you're releasing a thousands of little microplastics out into the air. The area that you consume the most nanoparticles of plastic is the air because it's just all consuming. I am negative, Nancy. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> and then these are all the landfill items. If it crinkles, like a chip bag or something, makes that crinkle sound. It's probably a lamp. It's trash, most likely. Um, oh, my light's getting bad. I'm so sorry. Uh, animal, I saw that there was a thing about animal waste in the, in the questions. Animal waste is trash. That's got to go in the trash. It, it cannot be composted. There's so, that one, we don't take biosol biosolids, uh, but also um, there's so much potential issue with uh animal waste, the uh, medication it's on, what they're eating, the potential of worms, everything across the board. And we don't want that in our soil. Um, and then the paints, the hazardous waste, all of that is in here. These coffee cups, even if they stay compostable, they still have a liner on them. Uh, that is bioplastic that we can't accept. Plus this stuff, this coffee cup here specifically is lined with plastic. And then the last slide here, uh, that your household hazardous waste, really, 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 really important to, to consider. And I know that it can be annoying when you have to take your material to a specific place to drop it off and it's not just directly being collected at your curbside, but it's really, really important for the environment to make sure that the hazardous waste and the electronic waste is being disposed of properly. And that, um, cause it can't go into any of the containers. It can't go down a storm drain like medication, do not flush it. And it can't be abandoned in the environment. 
I would think that we'd all would know that's obvious. Um, so there are safe collection centers that you can drop it off at. Um, be, you know, just look those up before you go because I know a few have closed. There are collection events. There's other some cities have other types of uh, centers for you to drop off at. And then with the sharps, the the lancets, the you know what you do if if you have to, um, maybe you're diabetic and you have to use uh, sharps every single day as well as pharmaceuticals, there was state legislation that was passed and your pharmacy should be able to have a drop off for you or they would be able to, and they'll also be able to provide you with that container, that little biohazard container up there, or they will give you the, the information to be able to have that shipped off, not at your cost because that was state legislation that was passed. So you should have the opportunity to be able to dispose of this stuff at the place that you buy it. And if you're ordering it online, then those companies also have to provide you with the opportunity to be able to dispose of that appropriately and easily. Uh, that's it. <laughs> I know, Senator, you got some questions. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, this is great. I'm getting a bunch of text messages from people. Um, well, first of all, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Jessica, for, uh, for all information. I will say, and a couple of people have commented on this on the chat. It really, the fact that you have to spend 20 minutes weaving in and out of every single item and how, you know, it, it really does underscore how important it is that we did SB 343 and 54. We've put so much burden on regular folks to go through all the extra work associated with understanding all of the nuances, this type of paper, that type of paper, you know, this item, that item. Um, as I have now toured endless numbers of recycling facilities and composting facilities and MRFs, I'm starting to understand, but you know, it really shouldn't be this way that, that you have to, you know, uh, you know, treat this like a, like an, a, you know, a, an AP class in, um, in recycling, just to be able to know how to act responsibly. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's why we need to shift the burden of this whole conversation to producers and others. Um, you, so that we just have less, so that we have less stuff going out onto the market that doesn't have circularity. So that being said, let's, let's start hitting up some of these questions because there's tons of great questions. I mean, I, I, so many questions and I, I'm going to, let's try to see. Gonna, what I'm going to try to like turn on my light here. So y'all don't see me sitting in the dark, but go right ahead. Ask me. And I encourage you, Jessica, by the way, um, you know, also, as you're doing this, go through some of the chat questions too. If there's anything that comes to mind that you can quickly answer, please do okay. so. Um, uh, one of the questions was about how a Girl Scout troop wants to re wants to tour a recycling facility. Yes, yes, yes. I really encourage people to tour these facilities. When you go and actually see a facility, it will really help you understand all of this so much better. I think we all love the fact that we can just put our trash out on the on the sidewalk or in the in the alleyway or in the bin, and it just magically disappears. And you kind of wonder, well, why isn't more of this stuff actually getting recycled or why is why is the problem so big? When you go to one of these facilities and you see the enormity, the collected, our, our collected waste together, I, I think it helps to uh, helps you better understand why this is such a problem that actually does require big public policy solutions. So, so um, you know, is Athens open to tours for student groups and, and community groups and that kind of thing? We are a little limited because our site is so small. So if you are a business customer of ours, we 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 might be able to pull it off. We don't do tours, unfortunately, because it is a working environment. It's really yeah. hard to do tours for for youth under the age of sixteen, uh, okay. because we don't because it's a liability risk. What I will do is However, we do. We have a really amazing video on YouTube as well, which uh, Kiki can put into the. Um, Share screen, but we do some, we do some tours. Well, check out the out. video. Um, you know, I like I know that there are, I think the LA I think the city of Santa Monica uh, has a waste collection center that 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 does offer tours. Why don't you if, if you want if you're interested in a tour, contact my office and we'll put the contact in, in the chat and we will help you find a place near you that will um you know will offer a tour. Obviously, we want you to pull together a group of people to make it worthwhile, but but we I want to help people do that. The second thing I will say, as I'm going through the chat, you know, I think in the past, the tendency has been when in doubt, throw it in the recycling bin. I got to say, I think the real answer these days is when in doubt, put it in the trash. Don't. Bin, yeah. Right? 
No, I, I, I it's called wish say, cycling. Right. Um, the stuff that we know that is highly recyclable, glass, aluminum, well, mo glass bottles, that kind of thing, you know, aluminum, um, water, bot plastic water bottles and clean paper, whether it be, you know, newspaper, office paper, that kind of thing. Nearly everything else, you probably should be putting in the trash can, right, Jessica? Did you say cardboard? The cardboard as well. I'm sorry, of course, cardboard, so like non wax biggest... cardboard. Yeah, so paper, for Athens, you can do shredded paper, but we'd rather, don't shred unless you have to, because you minimize the ability to recycle it multiple times. Magazines, uh, the drinking cartons, uh, metal, tin, um, aluminum, uh, glass, if it's food container glass, cardboard, plastics one, two, M5. Am I missing something? That's, I mean, I would say <laughs> that's basically it. So don't err on the side of putting in the blue bin, err on the side of putting in the trash. I hate to say this, by the way, because we don't want more waste going to the landfill. But the truth is, it's why we're all trying to work to reduce and find more circularity and produce and, get, and give this, the producers more responsibility in all this. Because, you know, as much as we may like, we, we may want, deeply want all this stuff to be getting recycled. You know, it, it ends up being so difficult to make the recycling work on a mass scale. Uh, you have to have a market for it. It has to be easily sorted. It has to then easily be turned into something new. So um, anyway, let, let's let with, with that all being said, um, let, let's, you know, and someone asked about coded papers. I mean, you know, in general, that's a no-go, right? I mean, anything with a coding is usually not a good thing to put in the recycling bin, no? So, so what, my light just went out. So sorry. <laughs> uh, the more coding, like magazines we're going to take because it's going to be a mixed paper type. Uh, the and, and there's a certain level of coded paper that can be collected within all the mixed paper. And that's for us to know, you know, that we work with our recycling uh, plant that's going to be taking the paper. And they're like, your quota of coded paper is up to this amount. So they're still able to take that, but they don't want the whole entire thing to be that. So for us, I would just say, you know, if it's not covered in tape, if it's a magazine, if it looks like a magazine, you know, is that kind of coding? Just put it in there and we'll deal with that when it comes to the paper, because it's, it, that's, that's so nuanced that I'm just sharing with you with information of someone who's been in the industry for 16 years. That I do not expect anyone on this call to, to be able to consider. I just want you to put it in the right container, you know? <laughs> okay. All right. And then um, uh, wrapping paper, we're about to go into Christmas, Hanukkah. Where does that go? No, no, not recyclable. Okay. If it's like the craft paper and it's, you know, doesn't have glitter on it and any other additives and it looks like you're wrapping it with like a high end version of a paper bag, then yeah, fantastic. But Okay. Now, what about um, aluminum foil? Does it have to be cleaned before being put in the recycling bin? Uh, if it's got stuck, you know, burnt food on it, how clean does it have to be? Uh, it can't be dripping. So it needs to be dry. And then when it comes to aluminum, um, so if it's, if you, if the whole top of your lasagna came off, uh, off on the aluminum foil, then no. Okay. Toss that. But if it's got some food remnants on it, the thing is with, with metal, when it gets recycled, it, it the, the, the leftover food, if it's not a lot, is not going to be a problem. It's when it's a ton and it starts to like contaminate everything else around it. Okay. So, and what about um, parchment paper? Trash. Okay. All right. Um, so what, so how much of the waste that we, do you have a ballpark? Just, you know, someone was asking how much of the waste that we typically put in the recycle bin is actually getting recycled. Do you have a, a general sense? Cities have to have a diversion rate of 50 <laughs> so you have to have a diversion rate. I have a ghost. So you have to have a diversion rate of 50% or more on the recycling. It's really hard to say, oh, in your particular city, this or your particular container, that. Uh, right. When it comes to plastics, I can tell you most plastics, I, not saying that people are putting it in the recycling, but everything around us is plastic. The paint on my table, my boom mic, my coaster, whatever, that's got plastic involved in it in some way. But really only 9% of all plastics is really being recycled. Yeah. But the, but a lot of the plastics we deal with 
on a daily basis for like throwing it away is the containers. And those now, what, are you- what are some things that people put into the bins that you guys see all the time into the blue bins that, that just are, are a problem? Like what, what are the, what are the biggest culprits that are really? Oh, I yeah. Oh, I got a list. Um, so Give hazardous and medical list. waste. Is medical the waste, not recycled. Batteries, batteries. Like you can, that puts so many people at risk beside the truck potentially catching fire or a fire being at the MRF or a tire running over it and it's setting it off. Like batteries are awful. Textiles, awful because they wrap up within the machinery and then they cause a huge problem. You go out there with a thing that looks like a machete. You have to stop the the the, the mechanics and like cut that thing out like every few hours. Uh, big bulky items that should never be placed in your container. If you cannot close the lid of your container, then you need a new, you need to wait till the next trash day or you need to ask for an additional pickup because you have to close that lid of the container. Yeah. It is so dangerous to have that lid. Behind me in the alley just yesterday, I was talking to my neighbor. Someone put a, a printer in there. Uh, a, a, a you know a printer like a, a computer printer in the recycling bin. Um, yeah, that's no, that's not good. And I just said, why this person said, why are coffee lids? Sorry, I'm only seeing them once in a while pop up. Why are coffee lids maybe acceptable? Uh, if they're white or clear, five or ones, then yeah, they might be. Go ahead, try it. But they're too small. They're too small, and they're not that. It doesn't hold that much value when it when it goes through the recycling system, and it might fall through the cracks. Um, but at the same time, a lot of those lids are not twos and are ones and fives. They're usually sixes. I would just say, if you can, please, 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 just bring your reusable container. Just do it. Yeah. If you have that privilege, do it. Now, metal lids from jars, someone just wrote. So the way it goes is, and this is that, you know, I, I used to teach recycling resource management at Santa Monica College. So yeah, it's like one of those, like, why did we not know this? If you go to our caniRecycleMy.com site, we actually break this down. If the lid is a different material than the container, separate them. And then at that point, you're looking at where do the two go, right? So if it's a glass container and a metal lid, they're both going to go in the recycling, but separate them. The glass is usually going, it's going to be broken anyways. And so the lid for the most part will be separated out. And hopefully that's going to be captured by the, the magnet or the eddy current separator, but separate them, make it easy. If it's plastic on plastic, leave the lid on because the way that the plastic bottles are recycled is that they are uh, pretty much floated and put pressure on. And so the caps pop off because the caps would be too small, right? Smaller than the size of your hand. So if you put that into your recycling as a separate cap, it would, it would be trash. So if you keep the lid, the cap on, the cap is usually number five plastic and the bottle is a number one. So when it goes through the system, the cap, it pressurizes it and the caps pop off. Not our system, but the recycling, actual recycling plant. And they will take the caps and they'll they'll take the caps out of that system and they'll be able to recycle it as a number five plastic. Yeah. You know, I think part of what people don't understand, and this is why, you know, and I, we, we are going to help people get tours. There's just so much stuff coming through down, you know, you know, as, as we all kind of like to hope in a perfect world that someone's going to get my cap and turn it into another thing. But we're talking about economies of scale here. And when you go to one of these centers, you're going to see there's just literally every second, uh, tons and tons of trash coming down the assembly line. And, you know, the question is, what's going to what's worth separating from the stream and sending somewhere else to turn it into something new? So that's what we have to keep think reminding ourselves of. I mean, at the end of the day, these these items don't have that much inherent value. They're pieces of of plastic. You know what? So the question is, how worth it? Is there a market there to justify picking it out of the stream, sending it off somewhere else, and turning it into a new product? And I think that's what you, we just have to remember the realities of what's yeah, happening through this stuff. But there is. I mean, we should be utilizing our curbside system, and we should be putting it within the system that exists because that is being bulked together as a recyclable item and being shipped off to be processed, right? And because we wouldn't be doing this if the recycling system wasn't working, first and foremost. But I do have opinions 
on taking a material and saying, it's so much better to recycle this product in any way, shape or form than putting it into the trash or putting it into the landfill. But the process to recycle it, you're sending it like a company like TerraCycle or something, and you send it across the country to be able to be processed into what like flower pots or something, if maybe that's what they're doing. And what is what is the the the, the impact right. of shipping that little bag of stuff that right. you collected across the country and, and you don't even know what's being turned into? Like yeah. when it when when the economy of scale is not local, when you don't have it bulked up near you, I just have a really hard time saying, well, am I what's the impact? to the communities that are having to deal with the from the upstream of the, yeah. the transportation Look, it's why we have to reduce our waste in general right i mean you know so yeah. um okay uh um let, let me ask about um um you know, things that have to get so someone was also asking about the cost benefit of, of rinsing water we want to save water you know how much do you need to rinse stuff out wash them before putting yeah. it in their plastic containers that kind of thing if you think that it's going to get on paper, then you need to you need to rinse it off. If you have a peanut butter jar with a little bit of uh, peanut butter still left inside of it, it's not going to be that big of a deal. Don't 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 worry too much. I have to wash. I don't have a dishwasher, so it's easy for me to just. Oh, throw so we're doing the sink. rinsing to protect the paper from getting contaminated. That's yeah. why we're doing the rinsing. Okay, so it's not contaminating the plastic recycling process. Unless it's like you're leaving a whole hamburger in the container, right? And then that thing starts to mold and it creates a moldy, gross mess that once it's shipped to the recycling plant, it's like, oh my God, what is this? Like black mold going on. The little bit of remnants of food on plastic or metal is not going to be that big of a deal when it comes to the recycling. Most people don't know that. And that's something that I learned in the past five years and went, wait, what? Um, but but it does help like you you should not leave a full hamburger in there you should not leave a quarter of a hamburger in there you should empty it out but you don't need to make the thing spotless um right. but yeah you're protecting the other items around it like a so honey jar for example and if it's closed then it's not likely to contaminate the paper um even though it's got a little bit of honey okay um nope. plastic grocery bags you know, they, they don't go into the blue bin. No. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's no economy for that right now. And unless they are collected like at a grocery store and the grocery store is partnering with a company that is actually taking them back and, and, and making them into something like they usually do like furniture, like bench, yeah. outdoor yeah. benches and stuff, then no, there's the economy for it is very little. I do see that maybe it will come back around. Maybe. Uh, but it might be limited to, oh, the stuff that makes it in the stream. Or yeah. makes it what I've taken to doing is I now, when I go to the market, if I if I forgot or if, I, if I'm stopping by without having brought my own reusable bags, I ask for the paper bags and then I use the paper bags for our composting. Yeah, it's perfect. Uh, bin. And, perfect. and then that, the, those, are, those paper bags are fully compostable. Yes. Fill up that paper bag with food waste and then just put that directly into your green bin. Does someone uh, just share a chicken recipe? I need that. I just saw that. I love it. I love it. You're now, amazing. Whatever that was. Cork goes in, corks, wine corks go into the into the composting, right? No, because they're not food based. Well, it's so truly, if it's truly organic, anyway, we, 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 yeah, I don't know. Well, it's here's the it's problem. A plastic cork, this no. This is this, yeah. It's like if it's a real cork. Actually, I think we do take that. I, uh, Kiki, will you double check on that? I think we do take the real cork ones. I think we made the decision. I just want to make sure that it's not in violation of CDFA or OMRI, but yeah. Kiki will check that real quick. Hi, because sorry, we did I've been check. lost in the chat. Well, we're, we're checking corks. corks. Yeah, can you go check to make sure corks. that corks is not Got a it. violation of A lot of, of corks, CDFA? unfortunately, are, um, are, are plastic, but but the real they corks. Are. Stuff you get from the good places, uh, I think they. I think I'm pretty sure you could put them in the composting bin. You okay. can put them in your backyard, 100. percent I just want to double check. What was that, Kiki? Real corks. If you made it made from like tree bark and such, you can compost those. But it may be difficult to identify if you don't know what it's truly made out of. If there's any sort of mixed blend to make your cork. All right, let's move on to cartons. So you know, isn't a carton a hybrid monster? Why is the plastic seal on cartons not good? Um, why is the what the plastic seal on cartons not good well because it's a totally different material 
the plastic right. sill. So I, I think uh, Nancy is discussing like if you have a milk car and you have a cap, right? But inside is a little tab that you pull out. Yeah. So she's she's wondering why is that tab that you pull out not okay to recycle? I'm not sure what. So if you have a carton, like a soy milk container carton, that thing you just have to make sure is completely empty. Put the cap back on that thing so it doesn't like leak out or anything. Put that in your recycling. Not all waste haulers are going to take those. The When we talk about those little metal lids, yeah, that thing's going to be trash. I'm 100% sure when it goes to the carton recycling facility, they're just going to get rid of that thing. If you have like a yogurt container and it's got that metal lid on it, that is trash because that is not foil. Most people think that's tinfoil. It is not foil. And a lot of it actually has chemicals on it. I have a video on my personal nonprofit page where I set the thing on fire and you came and set it on fire, it just releases this like really bad toxic black smoke that comes up from it because it's layered with chemicals. So that thing is not oil, throw it away. Yeah. Okay. What about now styrofoam? You know, foam is, well, even in LA County, unincorporated is out and then yeah. city of LA out. Uh, no. if you're if you if you are really really into this and you, and you have a lot of sty clean styrofoam there are plenty is one place in Compton that'll take it and you can contact our office but but, but are they still taking it because I thought they stopped taking okay. um at, at least a, a year or two ago um they were but but we'll we'll double check that but otherwise yeah the styrofoam unfortunately goes you know smack dab into, into the landfill um, but yeah, parents, someone's saying that Ridwell will take your stuff from, okay. Well, if Ridwell's taking it, it's because they're taking it to the Compton facility probably then. Yeah. But the thing to, I think the thing about these cartons for people direct, you know, and, and this is the thing to think about over and over again, the more different types of materials that are in these products, the harder, basically the less recyclable becomes. I mean, I've moved from, and tell me if I'm wrong about this, Jessica, but I used to, I used to love those, um, those little you know, milk, you know, soy milk boxes that you didn't have to refrigerate, you know, until you open them. Well, those That's are- That's the carton. That's the Tetra Packs, the carton. Yeah, those are the yeah. Tetra Packs, bad, bad, right? So it's actually better to get, right? Or are they are they recyclable? Well, they're recyclable. That's the cartons we've been talking about. They're recyclable, okay. but the problem is, is that there's only one facility. It's in Mexico. Athens is big enough that we're able to collect this stuff and send it off, but not all waste haulers are able to have that privilege to be able to collect that stuff and send it off because it's one facility okay. in Mexico that can okay. process this stuff. And rumor has it, it takes more energy and water to be able to recycle that freaking carton than it uh, does to create a new one. So there you go. Okay. See, frustrating. So, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, but I've taken it just buying the, the, the number one or two plastic container for my milk. Cause at least I feel like that's, going to be more likely to be recycled than the Tetra Pak. That's a higher ability to be recycled and into something that's a higher value recyclable. Yes. Um, and then, but here, I want to put this out here. Don't feel bad if you can't, as a consumer, be able to do it perfect. I have so many allergies that I can't even shop bulk half the time because they mix the containers. They mix the spoons. I would have, I would go into shock. So it's like, we have to give ourselves leniency on what we're able to oh, do, right. what privilege well, we have to be able to work within this system. And this all goes back to my earlier point that we need to, this is why we need bills like you know, 343 and 54, yes. which ultimately you know, put this responsibility back where it belongs on the producer to have some skin in the game to put products out there that are much more likely to be recycled. But you know, there we go. Anyway, um, I, now compostable plastic, you know, and there's been a couple of questions in the chat about this, right? Um, you know, people have, um, you know, asked about this question. I mean, I, I, you know, where people will say, oh, this, this is compostable in industrial facilities. I mean, for the most part, this is not actually compostable. You should be putting this stuff in the, in the, in the, in the trash, right? Usually, right? Yes. Uh, so there's reasons behind this. There's many. Uh, and I give PowerPoint, I give presentations, LA Sanitation is going to do some plastic symposium in January uh, about this and my whole entire presentation is about compostable plastic. Uh, the, if there's many reasons, one, these compostable plastics, if they're, if they are truly foodware and they are certified compostable by, um, by BPI, CMA or TUV, because that's it, 
then um, they'll say, oh, we've tested it. It's a high heat facility. But then the high heat facilities, that doesn't mean that they can take it. It doesn't mean that they want to take it. It doesn't mean that they can legally take it. So a lot of these times, this thing is certified compostable uh, within three to six months, meaning that there will be no residual at that point. And a lot of these facilities are doing their compost infrastructure within one month. And they and it's incredibly expensive uh, to have excess land and uh, human capacity and resources to be able to keep compostables on site for past that, that past a one or two month time frame uh, to be able to process it as long as it needs to be processed. That's the first thing. The second thing is that OMRI, uh, Organics Material Review Institute, and CDFA, California Department of Food and Agriculture, say that you cannot willingly take and process uh, inorganic material. Bioplastics, by definition, under state and federal law, are considered inorganic. So these facilities that are selling their compost to organic farms cannot take this material. And if they do take it, it has to be so source separated out, can't go with the other stuff. They have to have a whole other section of their compost facility. They have wow. to have separate equipment. They can't to rinse out all of their containers every single time. There's a whole process they are not legally allowed to take it if they're selling their compost to organic farms. And most compost facilities now that take food yeah. waste are selling their compost to organic farms. And then there's more than that. It's unidentifiable. If it looks like plastic and it looks like a contaminant, it's out. Not going to yeah. take the risk. Gosh. I mean, yeah. You know, I, I mean, I guess, you know, un unfortunately for all of you watching this, you're getting a window into why this system is so messed up. Uh, and why we're all working so hard to try to fix it. Um, but, 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 you know, it's, there's so much stuff coming from so many different materials. And as you correctly mentioned, Jessica, so much more plastic in every aspect of our life, including our own clothing. Um, you know, it, it's just, it's made things so difficult for those of us that are trying to, uh, to, to, to create, you know, real circularity in our waste stream. Uh, so, you know, there we are. Okay, so we've we've answered uh, the questions about um, industrial facility waste, pet waste, of course. Um, you know, yeah. I mean, this is just so, this is confusing for people, right? Because when things say compostable, what is what is that? You know, what are they supposed to do, right? And and um, uh, here's a funny one. This is just gonna irritate everyone. Uh, yeah. The word biodegradable on um material that looks like that's made out of plants and looks like plastic is a legal terminology in the state of california you are not allowed to say that your foodware is biodegradable photodegradable or oxydegradable is a legal terminology in the state of california because it means nothing yeah all right this has been uh, well, okay. One or two more things, and then we're and then let's shut this down. <laughs> you go on forever. I mean, I, and I, by the way, I just appreciate everyone's participation. There's obviously so much interest here. Over a hundred um, comments, like, and I, I can only see a little window pop up once in a while. So, like, yeah. Um, what about ice or cold packs, ice packs, that kind of thing? Trash and do not cut them and put them down the drain. The only thing that you should ever put down your drain, down your sink or your toilet, are the four P's. See if I get them right. Poop, pee, puke, and paper. That's the only thing that should go down your drain. Do not. And only toilet paper, paper, of course. Don't don't put your office toilet paper. Toilet paper, yes, TP. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. I think uh, our, our former president tried to put a lot of documents down the toilet, as I recall. Um, yes. The even when it says like septic available or like um. You can flush it or whatever. That's illegal too. There is nothing like they've, there's nothing that actually is a certification for something being able to be flushable. That's greenwashing. Now, now um, egg cartons, they are, they can go in the composting, right? Typically. Yeah. If they don't, if they're not the plastic ones or have like a ton of, like you have to remove that plastic thing. Like sometimes there's like that, it looks like the same material that you would use for a magazine is like attached to the top yeah. of it because they're saying my chickens are happy and Fred and Astaire gave you chick 
eggs, you know, you got to remove that. <laughs> right. No, and I am I am getting uh, some mess. I mean, there, there are some cool products that are out there that are going to help solve the problem. And one of the cool things about our bills is that they're really leading to a significant amount of research and development and investment dollars in those companies that are trying to find the next generation of more sustainable products and packaging. I'll give you one example, right? Obviously, styrofoam, as you're saying, typically is going straight to the landfill. Uh, mm -hmm. But there are those out there that have found an alternative to foam. If you think about styrofoam, right, that's that's basically a, a you know, product that's supposed to cushion your TV or your appliance to make sure it doesn't come dented or banged up or broken between Best Buy and your house, right? Or, or you know, from the you know, manufacturer to the retailer to your house, and then you toss it. Well, you know, at the end of the day, a blanket could do that job. You know, there are companies out there that have found, you know, there's a new company, you know, that, that, that's using a combination of, of shrimp shells and cornstarch and vinegar. And that's somehow found, uh, you know, that, that's, that's creating the same sort of cushion effect around appliances that, uh, you know, that does the trick of styrofoam, but it's fully uh, biodegradable, truly biodegradable. You could toss it off the pier here in Santa Monica and, and you know, within 10 years, it would be entirely dissipated in a natural way into the, into the environment. Um, so, you know, there we are, but, um, uh, there, there are some good products that are out there and we're, we're definitely, uh, you know, one of the good things about these bills is that it, we are seeing a renaissance in investment in the next generation of entrepreneurs that are producing these products and now looking for ways to scale them. Uh, and, and that, that's really, um, you know, that, that's, that's really, you know, exciting. So, um, you know, anyway, thank you everybody for your comments, for your interest, for trying to do the right thing. You know, I, I mean, there, there, there are, uh, I know there continue to be more questions. So, um, please do reach out to us, reach out to Kike. Kike has also put some great stuff online on, I mean, she's also posted the, the, the YouTube site. There are some videos. Uh, that the people can can take a look at uh, to to better understand, and then just keep advocating. And you know, we we need to we need to just keep pushing for for more legislation and also more entrepreneurship and innovation in the space. Uh, as as we as we as we all try to do our part, uh, but all this you know this discussion that by the way I've learned a lot from. I thought I knew more than the average Joe, and yet you've you've clarified a couple of things for me that I didn't I didn't know about Jessica. Uh, but it it does continue to underscore for me. How important it is that we 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 find systemic change here, uh, and 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 not just put all this on the on the backs of of our poor uh, consumers that are just trying to figure out, you know, they're also trying in addition to trying to figure out how to recycle, they're trying to get their kid to school and yeah, of course, go to work. And, and like I said, we all have different privileges, right? And I've been doing this for over sixteen years, and I was a professor of recycling and resource management. So yeah. like. <sighs> <laughs> there you go. Anyway, Amanda, do you want anything you want to add in before we jump off? No, I just want to say thank you to everyone. I saw that there was up to, I think, like a, way past 100. So that it was really nice to see the active participation from the community and just know that Athens is here to support. So we'll be working with the senator's team to follow up on those questions and really just thank you for the opportunity for Athens to to join you in this important conversation. Big thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Kike. Thank you, Jessica. You really helped us um, both. You both clarified, but you also, quite frankly, did a good job of making it, helping us understand, you know, also how confusing it is and how problematic a lot of things are in a way that I don't think everyone fully understands. Um, and, and I think, you know, we got to be open with people about those realities too. So I really appreciate it. Uh, this will be posted online. Lots more to come. Uh, but thank you, everybody. Really appreciate it. And how, everyone have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Thanks to my team, too. It's big, big, special, special shout out to Davis Hahn uh, and Tina and, and Jake and, and, and everybody else who helped to pull this together. Thanks.